This morning, we are returning to a passage from Scripture that we looked at, began to look at last week. It comes from the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 5, uh, verses 21 through 43 are the entire story. In my new revised standard translation, it has a little heading. And the heading uh, to this passage is, A Girl Restored to Life and a Woman Healed. So we're going to begin with the words that we shared last week about sort of the setup to this story. Verses 21 through 24. When Jesus had crossed again to the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came and when he saw him fell at his feet and begged Jesus repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. So Jesus went with Jairus. It was a simple response of Jesus. There was no interrogation of this uh, synagogue leader about what his understanding of the law was, about uh, what he thought about the coming of the Messiah. There was a plea and Jesus went with him. So last Sunday, our focus was on the middle of the story, what happened along the way when the hemorrhaging woman touched the garment of Jesus and was healed. And we'll go back to that story in a minute. But let's pick up the rest of the story of Jesus, Jairus, and his daughter. So what we're told in verse 34 is uh, Jesus has said... Um, Daughter, meaning the woman, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And while he was still speaking, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble your, the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, Jesus saw the commotion of people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he entered the room, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and they went into where the child was. And Jesus took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, come, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. And at this they were overcome with amazement. Jesus strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give the girl something to eat. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, we pray this morning that you might open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to know um, healing, to know amazement, uh, to find ourselves again as trusting in you. Through the power of the Spirit, renew this old story, make it new in us. Amen. So this passage that we have been reflecting on, listening to these last two weeks, is kind of a narrative sandwich, so to speak, made out of two stories that are layered together. Not by accident, though, but by intent. As you heard, it now for two weeks, it begins with a desperate father, a leader of the synagogue, who is pleading, we hear he's on his knees, pleading with Jesus to come and heal his critically ill daughter. The story is then interrupted by Jesus' encounter with a woman who's been ill for 12 years with chronic bleeding. We heard that story last week. And and in the midst of hundering, grasping hands, in the midst of people that we're told in Scripture are pressing in on Jesus, 
This woman believes that if she just touches his cloak, she will be healed. And Jesus feels that particular touch. And he asks his disciples who touched me. And in effect, the disciples respond, who, how, uh, why are you even asking that question, Jesus? You've got to be kidding. What do you mean, who touched you? Everyone touched you. They don't laugh out loud, but they also don't take Jesus's uh, question very seriously. It doesn't matter whether they do because the woman does. And in spite of their disbelief, uh, the woman comes forward and Jesus, who has healed this woman by a touch, uh, calls her daughter and sends her forth. So while this is going on, right, that's a story in itself. While this is going on, um, really like such a touching moment, right? I feel like we could just sit and mourn with this family. Some mourners come, some family, someone connected to Jairus and his daughter come to tell the father that his daughter has already died. And they say, so there's no, I mean, we get that, right? We would feel that, you know, we, we would probably be with them. So there's no point, Jesus, you don't need to come. You don't need to come. But Jesus goes. He takes with him these, uh, just a small gathering of folks. And he tells the crowd there that the little girl is not dead, but she's sleeping. And they laugh at him. It literally, that is what it says in scripture. It's not a modern trans. <laughs> We're not reading into this. It says in verse 40, they laughed at him. That's not possible. I mean, we know that's not possible. They knew that's not possible. These mourners are clinging to what they know to be true. And it is sad and it is grief. And they are not the first that we encounter in scripture to scoff, to laugh at the power of God. Um, remember in uh, the Hebrew text about Abraham and Sarah who each in turn laughed when they heard God's promise that they would have uh, bear a son and become the forebearers of a great multitude. Both Abraham and Sarah were like, do you know how old we are? It doesn't matter how old you are. You will uh, have this child who will become the father of a great nation. They laughed because the promise was impossible from a human point of view. And these mourners, again, you know, we've, we've all mourned, looking out at all of you, we've all mourned. We know what this feels like. Why should they take Jesus seriously? They know about death like we know about death. Uh, death is an all too frequent, unwelcome intruder in the homes of old and young, everywhere, throughout generations. The little girl is dead. That's what Jesus has been told. The little girl is dead. That's what Jairus has been told. Don't bother coming back. Your, your daughter has died. So what can Jesus do about this? Well, something miraculous is what Jesus can do about it. That in spite of the ridicule, in spite of the laughing, uh, Jesus at this home takes, and it's a, such a, you know, go back and read this again when you're, home uh, sometime this week. Just read the powerful way this story is written that Jesus just takes the little girl's mother and father up to the room and, and, and a, a few of his disciples. This is not a crowd event. This is not, this is not a big crowd event like the feeding of the 5,000. He uh, takes the little girl's parents and he restores the girl to life. the top pieces of our uh, story sandwich <laughs> are about this little girl, about the faith of this father, about the incredible, healing, miraculous, life-giving power of Jesus. So the inside of this story, though, you know, the, the, middle, the middle part of the sandwich, so to speak, is that story of, of healing that bleeding woman who has tried every cure but found no relief until she meets Jesus. These are 
two impossible situations that are put together. And at first glance, we might think maybe it's a little bit random. Just happened to be that this happened at the same time. But Mark adds at the end of this passage, kind of as an ap afterthought, and if you were uh, looking at it on the screen, I don't know if it, was, uh, if it was printed there like this, but in my Bible it's in parentheses. Just like as an aside. Oh, by the way, the little girl was 12. Oh, oh, by the way, the little girl was 12. Oh, and the woman who, who was hemorrhaging was, was hemorrhaging for 12 years. Oh, wait, 12. 12. There are the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel, the, the 12 disciples in this... Uh, Bible, there are literally a hundred, almost 200 references as I was looking up a little bit about it. Uh, use of the number 12. It is understood to be a really perfect number, to, to mean something more than just a numerical figure. It is in many places in scripture indicates the presence and the power, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and the authority of God. So 12, oh, wait, there's something, wait, there's, there's something else about this passage. Both uh, the, the little girl, how is she identified? How do we know her? She's a daughter. Oh, the woman who's healed, who's been apart from the community, who's been separated because of uh, being considered unclean. What does Jesus call her? daughter. Oh, maybe, maybe these two stories aren't accidental in the way they're put together, or the way we have heard them, or the way that we learn this story. Two needy outsiders. One who's on the verge of death, one who is considered unclean, become daughters, become identified as daughters of God. Both the woman and the father of the little girl, in spite of what everybody else is saying, take Jesus seriously. I love that, right? In spite of what the other people said about the woman, that she's an outsider, despite the mourners and the others saying that the girl is dead, both the father of the little girl and the woman take Jesus seriously. Both of them believe that Jesus can restore their life, the lives of those they love. Both kneel before him. Really amazing how this story is, comes to us. Um, so good. Revealing Jesus' perfect power in this twelveness to restore life in abundant life. As we hear in other passages where Jesus has healed and done miracles, uh, people and taught, people gathered um, were overcome with amazement, right? We would be too. Overcome with amazement. What Mark awakens us to is the abundant healing power and grace of Jesus, the power to be made well. Jarius' plea, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she made me made well. That's what we want. That's what we want for others. That's what we want for our community, our world to be made well. The woman hemorrhaging for 12 years, she deserved not only to be made well, but to live a life that went on in healing and hope. And that's what our desire is for ourselves as well. But we got to take a little moment here about real life. Not that that's not real life, but that's Jesus' life. Because I can't encounter these stories without acknowledging the human reality that we live in that we know, we do know in our own bodies and in others that there are illnesses that have not been healed in this life. That story of that woman hemorrhaging for 12 years and, Jesus, and she touches Jesus and she's healed. We've known people, maybe you even feel it yourself where you're like, I pray that be me. I pray that be, you know, 
the name of your friend, your child, your husband, your wife, your mother, your father, right? I mean, less than two weeks ago, I lost one of my very best friends to the ravages of diabetes for 50 years. She did everything. We prayed all the time. She could not be healed in this world, right? That's what we're going to hold on to on this side of heaven. On this side of heaven. Oh, my gosh. And then the story about, about, the, uh, about the little girl. And they come and say she died. And Jesus raises her to life. How many of us have had some experience like that? Where what we want is for that to be true. It is a heartbreaking reality that, again, on this side of heaven, we know human loss. It's unavoidable, right? Um, I think it was Woody Allen that said, um, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Um, there is a, it's a reality for all of us that we will die in, in this world. And it's a tragedy when we lose one young and we hold on. Again, I can't say this enough. In the story, this is the Jesus story of raising one from the dead. But in our reality, most of the time, death is the reality here on this side of heaven. Now, that's not the good, that's not all the good news for this day. Because um, I do believe, because I know it in my own life and I've seen it in others, that Jesus, the impossible work of God's power in this world is evident all the time some situation some story some person something in your own life that you're like there is no way out of this there is no way out of this this is too broken I'm too sick the situation is too desperate and something happens where like the hemorrhaging woman or the little girl raised from the dead we know life and wellness um, I've, I've talked about my godson before. You know, while I, I have had um, both the privilege and the sorrow of grieving with families where they have lost a loved one to an addiction, to an overdose, it is a tragedy that has um, swept our community, our churches, our nation. And I have a story of hope. You know, my godson, who I've talked about on different occasions, Chris, who was deep in addiction, deep in addiction, and now has been clean, sober, made well for over a decade. Um, he, was the, he was one that every day you prayed, you know, that Chris would be well, and he is. But not just kind of all right, you know. He stays in recovery groups. He's married. He's got three precious kids. And he's working in a job in Florida with a recovery center. Why? Because someone who's in recovery, someone who has seen the healthy part of life that goes on, who better than to work with young men who are dealing with the same thing? That's new life. That's one who you thought was dead is not. You know, I also thought about this, um, another story, another person came to my mind this week when I was thinking about all, um, all the people that I've had an opportunity to be with um, many years ago now, maybe, maybe 15. I was at a um, women's retreat at Olmsted Manor, and our speaker was Paula D'Arcy. She is a writer, has gone on to do an incredible work around grief and um, recovery from in through grief, and she's a counselor and does spiritual direction and does retreats. But her story, when we met her, when I met her, was because of the publication of her first book that told about the recovery she was dealing with, dealing with grief from the death of her husband and her two-year-old daughter in a car accident in which she was the survivor. And so when I met her, I'm like, okay. <laughs> at that time, no, this was longer ago. This had to be more like 20 years because I still had kids at home. 
And I was thinking, how does one recover? How do you, and not just recover, how do you go on? How do you make a meaningful life out of this? Um, she was pregnant at the time, three months pregnant. Has gone on, with a lot of hard work in prayer, has gone on to make such a meaningful life, not just for herself, not just, she's not just fine. And not that that story has never been part of her story, but she has gone on to have such a meaningful ministry with people in grief, with people who have lost children, with stories of how God continues to work in our lives, not causes these things, but continues to be present in our lives through great sorrows and tragedies. Both Chris and Paula are people to me that when I see them, I do think of that story of the woman who is brave enough to touch Jesus. I do think of that family who welcomed that little girl back from death into life. And I do believe that, yeah, the big stories are resolved that can't be resolved in this, in this life are resolved in heaven, healed in heaven. But in this life, we still have hope. So I hold on to these stories and I pray that it might be for me, for you, for our church, for us to be open to the power of God to make us well. To not just survive, but to thrive. So let us pray. Oh God, we are here this morning, our literally our whole selves. Our joys, our sorrows, our worries this morning, our grief, our wonder, ourselves. And on behalf of this congregation this day, I proclaim that we are open to the power that faces the impossible to make it possible that we commit ourselves to being made well in you and in this community of faith. Thank you for the witness of scripture and the witness of those with whom we have shared life to show us that power this day. Amen. Amen. Ah, and so